All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. I, I first want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their day to come all the way down here uh, to Mandalay. I, I thought I can walk. I'm staying at the, the Bellagio, and I thought it would be like a quick walk, and it was like, I don't know, it took me an hour to get down here. So I, I appreciate everybody here taking the trek uh, to learn about how to reuse code and in infrastructure um, or infrastructure's code. Uh, this is actually a repeat session. We've done this session a couple times um, over the summer in our, our summit series. Uh, I think we have a couple repeats. Um, but at the time, and, and he's really the star of the show today, um, it was going to be Ethan's first kind of public speaking engagement. And he was all kind of anxious of getting on stage and first public speaking. Um, and he was really concerned about like what, what he was going to wear. What's the right clothes to wear on, on some of this? And I, you know, I said, hey, my advice was whatever you're comfortable with, if it's, if it's a t-shirt or jeans, um, just roll with it, right? The, the important is to be comfortable over here. And so he, he was dressed much like he is dressed today, but I was dressed a little bit nicer, right? And his first minute, when I turned the microphone over to him, his first minute was like a roast session of me and like what I was wearing and stuff like that. So today, I'm bringing you the pineapple shirt. Uh, number one, because it's Vegas, uh, but number two, hopefully has new material for us uh, when I hand it over. Uh, so anyways, my name is Ryan Bachman. I am a specialist SA uh, focused on DevOps here at AWS. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about efficiency when it comes to infrastructure as code. So quick, uh, so quick agenda of what we're going to be talking about today. A uh, little bit of history lesson first. Uh, some of the challenges involved in that history le lesson and the evolution of infrastructure and infrastructure as code. Uh, the highlight, though, is going to be CDK with United. Uh, and then we're going to wrap it up with some of the community engagement program that we're launching both internally at AWS uh, as well as trying to reach the community uh, to help us build some of these, these constructs um, through these open source technologies. Uh, so I actually like to start with this quote. Um, I, I am a, a follower of Uncle Bob. I don't know if, you know, who knows Ro Robert Martin out there. Um, but I, I really aspire for like clean code. Um, and I don't think we invest in that enough. And I think this, this particular quote uh, relates a lot to my personal experience um, in this space, right? I, earlier in my career, I was involved with a lot of startups. Um, and, and working at startups, right, career's kind of volatile, right? You're somewhere one year, you're somewhere the next year. But throughout that kind of journey of, of startups, I would be rewriting the same cloud formation template in company A, company B, company C. I would just like rewrite the same thing. I don't know if anybody's uh, created a cloud formation template um, in VP, like for a VPC or an auto scaling group or something like that. But regardless of if you do it in your company or I do it in my company, it's going to look nearly identical. I mean, there's going to be some things that are different, uh, but 90, 95% of that code is going to be duplicate. Um, and, you know, doing it three, four, five times, I just, like, it, it became a slog. Like, it was, like, a necessary evil to have to go through. Um, and why couldn't we follow, you know, practices that developers tended to follow, you know, import libraries, use abstractions? Um, and so that's going to be the general theme of the talk today. Um, so this is where kind of the history lesson comes in, right? We, last 15 years, um, there's been an evolution uh, in infrastructure as well as infrastructure as code. Uh, I would argue, and so, you know, on the left-hand side, we have the on-premises uh, model where it's, it's physical hardware, it's, it's manual configuration, it's manual setup, it's slow, um, it's sometimes painful. And then all the way on the right-hand side is kind of where we're getting to today, especially when we start talking about CDK, where, where the lines between infrastructure as code and application code is, is blurred. Um, you know, I would argue my, my first kind of experience with um, infrastructure as code, um, and not truly infrastructure as code, but like with CF Engine about 15 years ago, right? If, if you're provisioning resources or dependencies, whether that's on the server or in the cloud or an API somewhere, um, you know, if you have code that, that provisions it, you know, I would argue it's kind of infrastructure as code. And so somewhere in the middle, we kind of partitioned it where like, hey, we've got configuration management and then we have infrastructure as code because we wanted to relate to a certain kind of persona. But I think we're, we're seeing an evolution to where all that's gonna be blurred. Right? And, and I think you'll see that a little bit when, when we actually put that in context to CDK. And then with this evolution, obviously we have certain challenges. Um, as, as we 
uh, as we have evolved, I think the demand for applications hasn't necessarily changed, right? We have the top of the funnel where every organization, every business unit needs to create some kind of digital thing, some new application, and so there's this huge demand up at the top saying, I need more of these. Um, but as you start going down the tech stack, right, we have a, a pool of developers or infrastructure engineers or platform engineers, and then we have a smaller group of people that can really specialize in different aspects of the cloud. And so what this does is creates kind of frictions and slows down velocity when, right, when, when you're separating kind of these responsibilities, like your infrastructure code, like they have to only do this thing. If we're not enabling our organizations or moving up that funnel, we're just, we're creating roadblocks and speed bumps for ourselves. And then more specifically on kind of the challenges as it relates to infrastructure's code, especially on the cloud, uh, and this kind of relates back to kind of my earlier um, points where we're spending too much time kind of rewriting the same things. The other things that we're also forcing ourselves to do is almost becoming experts on some of these resources um, you know, or solutions that we're, we're leveraging in the cloud. Uh, what toggles do we need to enable for this particular service? There's a new, you know, there's gonna be a bunch of new services announced here at reInvent this week. Um, how, do, how do we become experts on those things quick enough to, to adopt them and ensure that we're um, adhering to best practices and, and security and all the things? And so this is really where I think code reuse comes in. You can really scale through this model where you have your subject matter experts in these individual components. Um, and you can start thinking about how, how do I take these patterns or how do I take these best practices, how do I encapsulate it into some kind of artifact or some kind of module or some kind of library where then I can um, you know, share it out and reuse throughout my organization or even broader throughout the community. Um, so the talk is generally about CDK, but I would be probably, I'd probably get in trouble uh, by some of the, if I didn't make, uh, make mention of CloudFormation. So we have two infrastructure as code frameworks here, right? We have cloud formation and we have CDK. Now everything conceptually what we're talking about today can still be achieved in cloud formation. The, the, the concept of encapsulating this complexity in a modular format um, in cloud formation can be done with cloud formation modules, right? Um, they're just version packages of templates that you can publish to a registry. You can kind of, you know, abstract complexity, require some inputs. Um, and then reuse those libraries to help accelerate um, your, your development of infrastructure as code or, or provision your infrastructure um, using CloudFormation. But today's talk is generally about um, CDK with United. Uh, and with that, I am actually going to introduce my colleague Ravi, who is going to introduce our customer. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ravi Palakadetti. I am a solutions architect here at AWS, and I'm currently helping United Airlines. I'll take a couple of minutes just to set the context for this talk, right? So um, like any large organization, uh, United Airlines used uh, uh, looked at AWS as a cloud provider um, to attain a business goal, right? And, and there are several business goals, uh, as you can imagine, in this climate with uh, COVID and all the, um, all the disruptions happening. Uh, so a couple of things that United Airlines focused on is growth uh, and being very customer-centric. Um, so growth in all aspects of the business, uh, that's modernizing the fleet, um, you know, and, and those things needed, uh, the, the backend needed to build those kinds of uh, functionalities um, were not available in the current on-prem environment, right? So um, United is using uh, AWS to, to scale, to be able to, um, you know, grow from a, from a business perspective. Uh, at the same time, there's also the um, uh, ability to be very customer-centric, and that's an iterative process. So to, to be really customer-centric, you wanna uh, build new things, try them out, make sure that they're uh, what the customer is expecting, uh, and have a really you know, frictionless, uh, frictionless experience for the customers. Um, so, so that's kind of the business aspect of it, right? Um, and then there are a few technical capabilities that, that uh, organizations need to build their muscle on. Um, agility gets talked about quite a bit, um, so at the moment, uh, United has hundreds of um, 
of applications in production running on AWS. And these are, you know, some of them are mission critical applications. So the observability and resilience and capabilities like that uh, end up becoming extremely important to be able to uh, run the business without any disruptions. Um, and United has a, a goal to get into thousands of applications running in production. So uh, the, the habits and the mechanisms need to be built now uh, to be able to address um, that scale going forward. Um, another thing that happens in, in large organizations, but in you know, many organizations, is uh, there is a core uh, center of excellence for a lot of capabilities, right? So um, things like security, things like resilience, um, uh, you know, focus on, on governance, focus on being able to deliver um, capabilities for your customers very fast. There are some muscles that need to be built, and organizations have, um, uh, you know, centers of excellence for it. So uh, having a good CI-CD pipeline and, and something like CDK will help build those centers of excellence and, um, and amplify those centers of excellence to all the different teams that are, um, that are going to be consuming them going forward. Um, and finally, you know, uh, cloud adoption goals. Uh, everybody, all our customers are, uh, are sensitive to cost, they're sensitive to governance, security, so you need to build some best practices, you need to build some muscle to be able to um, handle that kind of, um, that kind of growth. Um, so every, every organization is different. Um, and to talk to us about how United is able to achieve success in this, uh, in this complex environment, um, I'll welcome uh, Ethan Ruchinski. He is a, uh, plat he's a principal architect with the ancillary platform uh, at United Airlines. Thanks, Ravi. Can you all hear me OK? OK, I guess yes. Um, so yeah, unfortunately I didn't come up with any jokes about Ryan's outfit this time. I usually have like way more time to sit there and just ponder, but uh, so I'll just kick it off. Uh, so yeah, first of all, I also want to say thanks for coming. Um, yeah, it is pretty far. And uh, you know, I know you guys passed up like your lunch hour, your delaying lunch to be here with us um, to talk about infrastructure as code, nerds. Um, anyway, so we got our agenda out here. Um, I'm just gonna tell you like our story about how we came to, you know, choose the CDK. Um, obviously, like, when you try to do stuff at work, you often want to have a problem to justify, like, why you're going to go out and do things. Um, my boss, who is here, I don't think he would let me just, like, spend a year working on stuff um, without any reason, um, at least knowingly. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to tell you about our story, why we came up with this. Um, before I do that, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about me. So my name is Ethan Ruchinski. Uh, I'm a principal architect at United Airlines. I oversee a couple of application teams architecture. Um, just prior to this, I was on a platform operations team. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what that means in a minute, uh, where our responsibility was to really help application teams uh, move to the cloud. Uh, and that's kind of how we came up with what we have today. Um, this hasn't been my only career at United, so I started off uh, as an IT intern uh, writing some Swift code. Um, I used to write like Objective-C as my first language, uh, so I felt like really cool going in every day and like tracking my memory usage, um, and then you know, kind of like bullying my classmates who had memory leaks and stuff like that. So it was kind of a fun time, and then coming to Swift, like you have a lot of hand-holding, um, so I didn't like it as much, and I decided to get out of the software game. Uh, so I moved into data analytics, uh, worked as a data analyst on some fuel efficiency programs at United for a while. Um, and then, you know, eventually when your supervisors like find out that you know how to code, they ask you to write code, and then all of a sudden I'm back here. Um, I'm a lot lazier now, so I like JavaScript, um, and I'm good with it. So it's pretty cool. Uh, a couple fun facts about me. I've flown almost a million miles uh, since I started at United in 2016. Um, much of this is through our standby program, so you can fly around pretty much for virtually free. Uh, and then also, I like rock climbing, um, just like the rest of your yuppie friends. Uh, and then finally, I have four AWS certifications. Um, so yeah, in Chicago, it gets really cold in the winter, obviously, and so like, you don't really want to leave your house. Um, so I just turn on A-Cloud Guru and then like, do the certifications. And then I like, you know, like run to the certification center with my like jacket and the scarf and stuff, and then you sweat in the room, and then and then you get the certification. So it's super fun. Um, this winter I chose a different pastime, which involved like more trips to my local liquor store, but um, it's been pretty good. So um, anyway, so let's talk about United. So we are a huge uh, company. We have tons of legacy code. Um, we've merged with different companies that have 
technology over the years, so obviously our tech stack is extremely complicated. Um, we run a couple data centers, and over the past few years, we've been really trying to move to the cloud, um, and I think it's, we've talked about this quite a bit, uh, even at last year's reInvent, that the pandemic had us rethinking our cloud strategy a lot, and uh, migrations to the cloud have just you know, skyrocketed since then. Uh, so I put this slide together actually back in the summer, so these numbers are probably a bit low now, um, but we have over 200 applications in the cloud already today. Uh, we run those across over 120 uh, AWS accounts, and we are using approximately 100 different AWS services um, all over our company, so our mass migration is in full swing. Um, and with this active accounts thing, uh, you should be doing this, so, so this has been really helpful for us. Since we started with the cloud at United, you know, one of the things that's been a core tenet of how teams deploy into the cloud is that they have full control over the infrastructure that they create. Um, so even if you're going through another DevOps team, we really do have the opportunity to create purpose-built uh, purpose-built infrastructure for your application. Um, so that's really the value proposition of the cloud, right? Like not just taking some standard architecture, uh, it's building what works for you. Uh, we've done this through infrastructure as code, that's how we can make it repeatable. Uh, and then we have strict policies around how we deploy infrastructure as code, uh, and it enforces consistency, right? And our infrastructure as, co of, uh, as code provider at United has been CloudFormation um, since we began this journey. So, you know, obviously when you're going to deploy to the cloud, you often have to rely on another team that's gonna, you know, help you get your infrastructure up and running. Um, but at the same time, right, like we want to build infrastructure that makes sense for our application. We want to bring in components when we want to produce a new feature that's right for us, right? Um, so relying on external teams to do this isn't always uh, the best approach. And so uh, what we came up with in our area was this concept of something called platform ops. Um, so uh, what that really means to us is that like we look at your cloud journey as, you know, kind of this multi-layer thing. Like, um, the first thing at the bottom is the ecosystems, like what are your accounts like, what are your networks like, and you t tend to have central teams that manage that. Um, then in the middle we start to get to what we consider the platform, which is compute, you know, traditionally this could be like people running Kubernetes. Um, for us, we want teams to own their infrastructure, we'll talk a bit about that later, um, so that really means like our platform is however people deliver to the cloud, so CI, CD pipelines, infrastructure as code. Um, and then what app teams are responsible for is their application code at the top of that. Right. Um, so what our platform ops approach was is to, is to take care of CI CD tooling, come up with some cloud reference architectures, um, and support app teams that are new to the cloud. And then we really want to get out of the way, right? Like we don't want to be in the loop at all. And um, so my bragging point is like, since I've been here, I've received like one question about using this construct library that we're going to talk about. And I don't think that people aren't pinging me just because they don't like me. Like I think that they actually don't have to contact us which is cool, so I like sleep at night, um, I have less work, still enough to fill a 40 hour work week, don't worry, um, but yeah, it's pretty nice. It's a, it's a cushy life when you do this. Uh, so anyway, so right, like I said, we use CloudFormation. What we found is that the first mover teams become experts in CloudFormation. Um, so when I started deploying CloudFormation stuff back in 2019, a couple of us got together and we were trying to figure out, you know, how do you do Fargate Spot? How do we use our instrumentation tools? Um, and we deployed like one of the first um, like fully Fargate spot microservice application across multiple regions at United. Um, so, I mean, I think like I'm here, so I think we're like experts now, right? Um, so we know how to do this, right? And we're, we're really good at CloudFormation. The other thing that we did is we figured out how to connect everything, right? Like you're typically not deploying one resource, especially in the case of ECS, you have task definitions, roles, security groups, services, target groups, load balancers, Route 53 records, right? So a ton of stuff that you have to connect. You have to do it all by hand, and you have to do it all in CloudFormation, right? And then finally, like, you're probably not deploying just one service, right? You're probably deploying more than one. Like Ryan talked about, you're repeating yourself, um, so you're gonna have the same code over and over and over. So, so what do you do, right? So in CloudFormation, what you can do is you, come, you can come out with, like, templates, right? So I can say, this is what my services look like, I'm just gonna pass some parameters, and I'm gonna be able to deploy a service all the time. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, like what if I don't have a parameter in there? What if I don't have a feature, right? And, there, and there's other problems with this. So like one of the growing pains of CloudFormation is that things basically get stale. Like you write your CloudFormation, um, there's not really a super great way to version it. Um, you don't have like encapsulation. Uh, it's hard to do kind of parameterized default behaviors and stuff gets stale. Um, so best practices, right? 
Um, like for us, it's Fargate Spot in lower environments, right? Like that's new. So if you deployed three years ago, you might not have that. So that's stale. Policies, you know, TLS policies change all the time, right? So um, if you're on the old version of TLS, that's stale, right? And then code that you got from Bob, right? So your coworker, he deployed, you know, an SQSQ in 2018. It happens to have some cloud formation for that. So he shared it with you and then you used it. And now you find out that those have to be encrypted. Bob's code sucks. You have to work overnight because the security team blew up your MD. You know, it's not great. So you, you, you know, it gets stale. So we want to do something totally different as we try to solve this problem. And another thing that we're doing is like as teams migrate to the cloud, they have a you know, great history of deploying software on-prem. We want to meet them and leverage the skill sets that they have, the knowledge of their programming languages, IDEs, you know, all that stuff that they're already using. Um, but we do want to introduce some concept of centrally managed patterns that are you know, living and breathing and changing, right? So we need to have a place where we keep these things, where it's version, people can see what's up to date. And then in those patterns, we want to take care of policies and things. Like, we really want to shorten the learning curve. Like, if you deploy an application for the first time at your company, you shouldn't have to know what the tagging policy is, right? Like, that should just be handled for you. Uh, and then finally, but like, some people do want to customize stuff. Some people do want to add custom tags. So we need to allow for all of that kind of customization. So introducing CDK, right? So this is a way we can move kind of, we can sit above the cloud formation layer, we can create all of these properties and things, um, come up with incaps, like abstractions, uh, generate some cloud formation, uh, and, and that's our tool of choice. So let's talk about what this CDK is, right? So the CDK is a multi-language software development framework uh, for modeling cloud infrastructure as reusable components. Um, so if you were in the CDK session on Monday, you might have seen this slide before, um, but I'll point out that reuse is in the title of this session, so I stole it. Uh, and then, uh, so, yes, so, okay, just skip through everything, but, but multi-language, so at United we're using this thing in, in four technologies, so Java, .NET, um, TypeScript, JavaScript, and Python, so it really does support all of those. Uh, modeling cloud infrastructure, right, so just another infrastructure as code tool, and then, you know, focus on reusable components, right? So the CDK uh, is essentially just a class library, and we call those classes constructs, and there's, there's three or more levels. Uh, at the, at the get-go, there's these uh, level one CloudFormation resources. So anything that exists in CloudFormation, there is going to be a class in the CDK library that represents that thing with properties that map one-to-one. -one. So if you're very familiar with CloudFormation, you want to do extensive customization, uh, you can leverage these and have the full power of CloudFormation via CDK. On top of that, we start to get higher level constructs where we're making things like a little more human readable, we're doing default behaviors um, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so these are called level two constructs and they, they turn into level one constructs in CloudFormation uh, when they get synthesized. Uh, and then finally, we have level three plus constructs. So this is where we're making like really complicated reference architectures, stuff that crosses many services. We're doing default behaviors, we're looking up VPCs, uh, we're parameterizing stuff, throwing in your monitoring configuration, whatever it is, at level three and up. We're going to have these constructs across all of the services. So in the Amazon construct library, that is uh, the public one, you'll find constructs for really everything that is in CloudFormation and then really good stuff for a lot of the common services. Um, at United, we have custom constructs for uh, many of these. So what do these constructs look like, right? So here's an example of a level one construct. Um, so if you've created an S3 bucket before, this might look familiar to you. Um, I can create what's called a CFN bucket. So again, directly tied to like the AWS S3 bucket type in CloudFormation. My properties are exactly the same, right? You're seeing bucket name there. Um, we just get to pass in the properties and then it synthesizes out into CloudFormation at the bottom. So that line on the top is TypeScript and then at the bottom we're getting the resulting CloudFormation. Um, so these are available from day one. So whenever something is available in CloudFormation, it is available to you via the CDK and these L1 constructs. So L2 construct, I'm gonna actually attempt to use this in my demo later, is a VPC. So traditionally when you're deploying a VPC, you don't just want a VPC, right? You want subnets, you want routing rules, um, all that good stuff. So if you create a VPC with a level two construct, um, you're actually gonna get an architecture that looks like this. So we're moving above the CloudFormation resources and we're actually giving you the things that you need, right? So um, additional subnets, stuff like that. And then finally, and this is one of my favorite constructs, we have level three. Um, so this is an application load balanced Fargate service. Um, so if you're deploying Fargate services into the cloud behind a load balancer, chances are you're doing what this thing does. So with just 
like, I mean, really, like three or four lines of code here. Uh, we're creating everything from the task definition to the service to the load balancer. This thing actually can create a VPC for you. Um, we don't use that at United. We've actually just extended this for ourselves. Um, and it can do things like register your load balancer in Route 53. Uh, so really, really super powerful, um, super powerful uh, construct. And as you can see, like these four lines of code translate into 829 lines of CloudFormation. And then again, um, all of that stuff is fully customizable. So if there's even individual parameters you want to change in CloudFormation, you can do that with the CDK. So, and then finally, it's not just about these constructs. You have other things, right? So a lot of times when you're implementing classes, you're gonna create methods. Um, so all these constructs, they can come with methods. So for example, if you create a DynamoDB table, you can call the grant read data method on that table, um, provide in something that you want to be able to read from the table, and you get this policy created. Um, so I will also uh, attempt to show that in my demo too. So when we started to produce our own contract library at United, um, we went into the Amazon contract library, and we actually just extended a bunch of the classes. Uh, we got a couple of things like right away that were huge wins for us. Um, the first two were tagging and permissions boundaries. So basically any resource you create with the CDK at United now is gonna have our policy tags. Um, this is tripping up people all the time. If you're using CloudFormation or another low-level tool, you know, you're gonna go to deploy your stuff, and at deploy time, you're gonna get an IAM error that says you're not allowed to do this, right? And now you have to figure out, is that an SCP? Is that something missing on my role? And oftentimes it's, you know, you misspelled the name of a tag, right? So that's crazy, right? Like you don't care about tags. Let's deal with that ourselves. So we dealt with tags. Um, anytime you create an IAM role using the CDK at United, we put our permissions boundary on it. That is also required, so also trips up people all the time. And we're really shortening the learning curve here, right? Like, if you show up and you're a brand new developer on day one, you've worked with Python before, and you want to deploy a service into ECS, you know, you don't have to know anything about our tags, you don't have to know anything about our permissions boundaries. Um, and then finally, the next thing we did was uh, complex like Amazon ECS reference architecture. We talked about this before, this is our load balance Fargate service. Um, we do other kind of funky stuff in that, looking up our VPCs, looking up our hosted zones, and I think I have some code for that later. So I told you that you know, we dealt with tags, right? So this is actually exactly how we do it. Um, so the whole goal, goal is that our new users, they don't have to have PhDs in any of this stuff, right? Like, I got my reading glasses at home, like I can inspect the policies, like, and, and I get it, but I've also been doing this for some time and most people haven't, and, and they shouldn't really care about this. So with just these lines of code here, we're putting our permissions boundary on, we're putting our tags on, uh, and, and that's it. This has worked for every single resource that we've deployed. So the next thing we did is we have some you know, pretty simple level two constructs at United. We wanted to switch to using CloudFormation generated names. We're pretty heavy users of SSM. Uh, here we've got a policy compliant DynamoDB table, all of our tags on it. Um, again, those tags are coming from the other thing I showed you before. They're not even in the UAL table. Uh, and then you know, we're getting this SSM parameter using our common format with the name. And then there's this thing called aspects, where basically in the CDK, I can inspect every single CloudFormation resource that you're going to create before your CloudFormation is finally generated. Um, so, uh, so this is an example of where I'm creating an IAM role just with the account principle. And when that gets synthesized via my aspect, it's gonna get that permissions boundary applied. So any role you could possibly create with our tool is gonna to have this. And then finally, we have a little more information about our specific ECS reference architecture. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you wanna produce if you're using the CDK at an enterprise. Uh, where we're turning 34 lines of TypeScript into 451 lines of CloudFormation here, um, and often quite a bit more than that. So when we rolled this out, like we also had a bunch of other stuff that just kind of happened to us that we uh, were really pleased with. Um, one of them is we can use the CDK to look up our networks. Um, so I've been in this space for a little bit, so I know a lot about how our networks are set up at United. Um, again, if you're coming from an on-prem world, you don't know that we have three tiers of subnets, right? Um, so, uh, so we're able to look those things up for you. Uh, we're also able to run our ECS workloads on Fargate Spot and Dev. So this was like a cool trick where behind the scenes we check and if you're in a lower environment, we can put you on Fargate Spot. Um, you can always override that behavior, but this has saved us um, quite a bit of money and people are uh, none the wiser. The other thing is we have change management here, right? So we're producing a class library. Those are often versioned. Ours is versioned, follows semantic versioning. Um, so you know when there's a new version available and what's changing. And we have auto-generated documentation. 
So, uh, so here's an example of where we uh, have some VPC lookup code on the, I guess, your left. Uh, and then on the right, we're able to kind of leverage that VPC that we find um, and just grab the subnets that we want for uh, creating something. <clears throat> Here's some code where like, we'll just check what environment you're in and, and pop you into Fargate spot. Um, so this is really it, right? Like, there's, no, there's no magic. Like, this is actually how it works. Uh, and then you know, the result of that right, is this version class library where we're able to keep track of things just like every other library that your developers are familiar with. Um, so for example, we have some release notes here. We released version 4.7.5 a little while ago, a um, couple of things we took care of. And then finally, the documentation. So we just use TypeDoc. Uh, people are required to put comments when they add new code. And we get this nice documentation just generated for us. Um, so it gets more fun. So we're producing this class library. We write it in TypeScript. And then we use a tool called the JSII. And we release it in all the other languages. Um, I just spent some time releasing it in Go, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, and the end result is that this, which is TypeScript, uh, which is my favorite language. Um, turns into this, which is Python. So we actually also have people using Python to do this. Um, Java, and then what a lot of my teams use uh, is .NET. So you're able to get the same functionality across all of the major programming languages. So this has been hugely beneficial because like, our developers, who again are coming from a .NET background, are actually able to use this tool right out of the box with all the skill sets that they already have. All the documentation is there from the Java docs, you know, uh, and, and it just works. So I do have a demo prepared, and I would like to show you an example of uh, where I've created some constructs and how they can be used. OK, so um, in this example, I'm going to start with essentially an empty account. Um, I've run the CDK bootstrap there. I have an empty CDK application. I'm going to deploy a Lambda function uh, that talks to an S3 bucket. However, I have two things I want to keep in mind. Number one is I have a tag policy, so all these resources better be tagged. And the second one is, um, for whatever reason, I want traffic to this S3 bucket to come from a VPC endpoint inside my VPC. Um, so I'm going to put a policy on that bucket that says that the traffic has to come from there. And now Lambda functions that get deployed, they better be attached to my VPC, or they're not going to be able to access that S3 bucket. OK. So we're going to start with some code here. So I have a Lambda function. Um, basically, all it does is just call the put object command uh, to whatever bucket it finds. Um, we're going to provide some key and some content, and it's just going to make an object in S3. Um, so this is my Lambda function code here. Um, really nothing special. Uh, and this will all be on my public GitHub, by the way. Um, we just have the S3 client. Uh, and I'm going to package this up as a Docker, uh, Docker image function. Um, so, so that'll be super fun. And then up here, I have my CDK application. So this is what you would get if you just ran the CDK project generator uh, on your machine uh, for TypeScript. But then, of course, it's available in the other languages as well. Uh, the only other thing that I've done here is I've created for myself two constructs. Um, so I'm going to use these constructs that I made uh, as I go out and deploy my infrastructure. The first construct I have is a stack, uh, an extension of the Amazon stack class. So everything you deploy with the CDK, it's going to come out as CloudFormation stacks. So CloudFormation stacks are your unit of deployment. Um, and there is a class that represents CloudFormation stacks in the Amazon CDK. And since everything is coming through a stack, that's where I want to start extending stuff and adding my functionality that should touch any resources that get deployed into my account. So as you can see here, I just have a class that I'm defining called the DOP302 stack. Um, it's extending stack, which comes from the Amazon CDK library. Um, let me close this a little bit. And as you can see, there's basically two things we're doing inside of the constructor for this. The first one is we're adding this tag. Um, so this should tag all of our resources. Uh, and the second one is this aspect, which I'll talk about in a bit. So what I want to do first is I'm going to try to create myself a VPC uh, inside one of these stacks. So I'm going to collapse my constructs here and just go ahead and get started on my new stack. So I'll just call this my VPC stack. And it'll also be a TypeScript. Uh, it'll also be TypeScript. So I'm going to make a new class here. And uh, as you can see, I'm going along. I'm getting prompted for DOP302 stack. So yeah, this is going to inherit from my stack class so that when I call my superclass constructor, I'm going to get all those tagging and things provided. <coughs> 
So I need to uh, define my constructor here. And all constructors for constructs in the CDK, they take at least two arguments, a scope, so like where do you want this thing to be defined, um, and an ID, so just something that, that uh, identifies it within your application. And then I'm also gonna take some properties, which are just stack props. So that comes out of the Amazon CDK, um, and I'll just steal it from there. First thing you do when you have a constructor is call the super constructor. And then after that, we can go ahead and start adding some resources. So like I said, we want to create a VPC. Probably now is a good time to also create our VPC endpoint for S3. Uh, and then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to capture the ID of that endpoint and write it into an SSM parameter so that we can use it later. So another great feature of the CDK is that we're gonna get type hinting as we do this. So I don't know if a lot of you have written CloudFormation before, um, but for me, I've really struggled with uh, like type hinting. It's kind of almost non-existent. Um, and then there's like VS Code plugins that get out of date. Um, but uh, in this case, we're actually gonna have like live type hinting as we go. So as I'm going to create a new VPC, it's now telling me what this class is, right? So we're about to create a VPC. Um, it says this spans a whole region. It's automatically going to divide the region. We can provide a CIDR block, um, all that good stuff. So, uh, so we're getting it as we're going along, and we're finding out what we have to provide. So first, we've got to say where we want it. We want it here. We'll give it an ID. It's just VPC. And I'm going to give it some properties. So I only want to create two availability zones, uh, or only two subnets in two availability zones for this one. I want them both to be private, um, and I'm going to specify a CIDR block. So, okay, so I'm gonna start typing availability zones. I got my argument right there. Just mouse over that. Uh, I can say like which availability zones I want, um, and I'm just gonna pick them. So I'll get from my stack, I can actually, there's a property called availability zones here. Um, I can see what that is. It's the AZs that are located wherever I'm deploying the stack, um, and then I'm just gonna slice this and get the first two. All right, after that, I wanna have some kind of subnet configuration, so I'm just gonna start typing subnet and let's see what we get. All right, subnet configuration. This is gonna be a way for me to say which subnets I want, and I'm gonna have one kind. <clears throat> so it's a subnet type. And we're gonna be private isolated, so no NAT gateways, no route to the internet. And I'll give it a name, which is private. Okay, and then the last thing I know I wanna do is I wanna provide some kind of uh, CIDR block. Um, so that's gonna happen through this IP addresses property here. And then I'll just grab this. Um, so I don't have like any special stuff to get this prompting, by the way. It's just the fact that this library is here and this is just VS Code. So I don't have any extensions except for like maybe stuff that I just have from TypeScript. Um, you'll just get this like any other class library. All right, I made my VPC. I want to add an S3 endpoint. Cool. And it's AWS service endpoint. Again, it, uh, in this case, oh, that's not quite what I want to do, actually. I'm going to do this. Okay, so on my VPC, I'm going to call this function to add the gateway endpoint. So that's going to attach this gateway endpoint to my VPC for me, as opposed to just creating a gateway endpoint. I will give it a string. I'll just call it endpoint and some options. So I'm gonna have to specify the service, and I want S3. All right, so that should create my endpoint. And then finally, I wanna save the ID of this endpoint in the SSM parameter. And it's gonna need a parameter name. and a value. Okay, so I'm using all L2 constructs here. I'm making a new VPC. I'm calling a method to get this gateway endpoint, and then I'm just gonna create a new SSM string parameter so I can keep track of the ID of this endpoint. <laughs> uh, so the next thing I need to do is I actually have to say I want to deploy this. So right over here, I'm gonna make a new object of this. Uh, I just want to deploy it within the CDK app. I'll give it a name. So this will be the actual name of my stack when it gets deployed. And then I'm also just going to say what region I want it in. So All 
OK, so I should be ready to go ahead and deploy this stack. And just for my command line here, I'm going to say I want to deploy the VPC stack. Uh, and so one of the other nice things about the CDK is I can get errors at synthesis time if I do something wrong. Um, and it looks like I did. So let's see. It's complaining about the name of my, oh, I got to do this. My bad. And actually, real quick, I'm just going to check that that's correct. So this is what I want it to be. <laughs> OK. So you don't have to wait until you get to CloudFormation to get these errors. A lot of these things have validations built into them, uh, so you're going to find out now. Um, earlier today, I was like practicing my demo, and I tried to make a slash eight CIDR block for my VPC. I just errored right away, so, um, and then I fixed it. Uh, I was thinking about like faking that mistake on stage so I could show you, but I guess we got a real one anyway. Um, okay, so while that is happening, I'm just going to try to print this out into a CloudFormation template just so we can take a quick look at what it's doing. So that VPC stack actually turns into this. So of course, we have our VPC here. Um, we have the tags. We're deploying a subnet, uh, route tables, uh, another subnet, another route table. Uh, and then we have our VPC endpoint as well, um, connected to those route tables, and we're saving that into this SSM parameter. Um, so this is literally the template that will get deployed by the CDK. Um, we don't have to care about that if we don't want to, actually, which is, which is nice. Uh, so that is probably happening right now. And while that's happening, I'm just going to go ahead and get started on my next stack. So now I'm actually going to deploy my application. And I'm super creative, so I'm going to call it application stack. And actually, I want to extend the DOP302 stack. Um, I could extend the AWS stack class, but I want that tagging and all the good things that come with it. OK, so inside of here, we're going to start deploying my application resources. So hopefully that VPC is there now. Um, my endpoint should be there. Then my router should be there. I want to make my Lambda, attach it to the VPC, create this S3 bucket, and give my Lambda permissions um, to access that S3 bucket. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So I have another construct I created, which is a DOP302 bucket. So this is where I'm going to do a little bit of policy stuff, where uh, I want to still make my S3 bucket, but I want to do another thing where I attach a bucket policy to this bucket that restricts traffic to come from my VPC. Um, so within the definition of this DOP302 bucket, I'm going to go ahead and, from the name of this SSM parameter, find the ID of my S3 endpoint. Um, and then I'm going to add a resource policy to my bucket, another method we're calling um, on the bucket class. Uh, and we're going to say, basically, if you are not me or the role that is deploying this thing, uh, you can't access it unless you're coming from this VPC endpoint, um, this bucket, or any of the objects in it. So this will give us that, uh, I guess, security that we want to have traffic come from our VPC. So we're just going to use that. And this is the kind of stuff that you could keep in your construct library, right? So people can import this, uh, and you can write it once and use it all over the place. Um, and I don't have to provide any properties, so my bucket should be fine. Uh, and then I want to deploy my Lambda function. And so like I said, we're going to publish a Docker image function. So let me just go ahead and do that. So again, just getting all of these uh, L2 constructs directly out of the Amazon construct library. So when you deploy a Lambda function, of course, you have to specify the code you want to use. So let me go ahead and do that. And we're going to use some Docker image uh, code. And it's just from that folder that we have. 
So this is telling the CDK that like, hey, in this other folder, there's going to be a Docker file and you can build that and then you're gonna have a Docker image that I want you to put into ECR and you know, run for this function. Um, so I don't have to do any of the complex legwork to build that image on my own, to publish it to ECR, to keep track of that image and tell Lambda where to find it. I'm uploading things to S3. I don't have to do any of that, right? So the CDK is gonna handle it for me. And then I need an environment variable here, which is actually just gonna be my bucket name and I'll just get that from here. Okay, so I'm gonna pull a little trick where I don't attach this to the VPC right here, um, and it's gonna be attached to the VPC, and I'll show you how that works later. And then finally, I need to give this function the ability to write to the bucket. So let's just go ahead and grant the write access. Okay, and then I also need to say that I want to deploy one of these. And I'm just gonna steal these properties. And let that run. So one of the other things that I included in my stack here is this aspect where I'm actually going to attach lambdas to the VPC. Um, so I'm not claiming this to be a best practice because it's not, um, but it's a cool trick that you can do. Uh, so this is what the aspect looks like, and basically what happens in an aspect, let me just prove that, uh, is any time that a contract is being created by the CDK, um, this visit function will get called with a reference to that contract. You can inspect the construct and make changes to it if you want. So in this case, I'm checking to see, is this a CloudFormation function? So is this a resource type AWS Lambda function? Um, and if so, I wanna do some stuff. So if it's not connected to the VPC, I'm gonna look up my stack. Um, I'm gonna call this stack get VPC function, uh, which is defined up here, where I can just look up whatever the VPC is for with this particular tag. Again, all of our stuff is tagged, so it should work. Uh, and then there's a bunch of stuff you have to do when you attach a Lambda to a VPC, right? So I'm creating a security group for those ENIs. Um, I'm granting egress on 443 because I'm calling the AWS APIs. Uh, I am then looking up the Lambda role and attaching a new policy, um, and the policy will allow this Lambda to create the network interfaces it needs. Uh, and then finally, I'm operating on the Lambda itself to add subnets and add the security group, and then I do not want to deploy that Lambda until, um, until my policy has been written. So, I better make sure that I've given that role the ability to create these ENIs before the Lambda itself gets deployed. Okay, so in this case, let's switch over to CloudFormation, um, which is over here, and take a look at this stack. Okay, so here's our application stack getting created. Uh, the CDK will deploy your templates in JSON. Um, but we can see we've got our bucket here, again, with the tag. Um, we have our bucket policy looking pretty good. Um, I'm allowed to access it, and so is my CloudFormation role. Uh, we have our role for the Lambda. We've got the basic execution role policy on there. We have a policy for putting to S3, right? So we didn't have to write this ourselves. It's now there. Um, and uh, also, notably, this policy, like, Basically, the people who write these constructs, they know what they're doing. So like, not only can you talk to the bucket, but also you can talk to files in the bucket. Um, and then finally, we have our Lambda function. Uh, and then here's the cool stuff where we've got our subnets attached in there. Again, I never had to type out any one of these subnet IDs. It just worked. Um, we've got the dependency on the function role, uh, security group, uh, IAM policy, again, for our role to create ENIs. Um, and everything looks good. So. So sometimes these take a little bit of time as like we have to actually create the ENIs. But let's see if the bucket is there. Okay, so just head over to S3 real quick. So in this window, I'm logged into S3 as the basically root uh, of the account. Um, so I'm not logged in as myself. Uh, so obviously I cannot list objects, right? Um, because our bucket policy says that I have to do that from the VPC. Uh, and the console is not in the VPC. Um, however, I'm also logged in as a role, and if this session is still active, so this is like my personal 
uh, or I guess it's a user, it's my personal user that I created for myself. Um, I said I want to be able to see what's in this bucket. Um, so of course if I click on the bucket, great, I can see that there's no objects, right? Um, so if we look at the permissions policy, that's because I'm named in this not principle. All right, so let's see. And as that's going, like, we'll just see if we can check the template for this as well. Um, so if you are a CloudFormation user, this, may, like, this ability to synthesize your templates, I think, makes life super easy because you can actually read them yourself um, and see if it's correct. Um, so this was the template that we would have gotten for this thing. A little bit of a friendlier format, which is YAML, uh, and we're seeing everything shake out basically as it should. Sorry, let me just check this one time. Um, yeah. So yeah, so at United, like we, are, we have produced a contract library where we write our own stack. Um, we actually do also have a contract for Lambda functions, which will do the VPC attachment for you. Um, again, you don't wanna attach Lambdas to the VPC unless there's like a real reason. So, um, so folks can choose whether or not to use that construct. Um, and then of course, like all of our uh, other resources and stuff will get tagged. Um, yeah, and okay, it finally worked. So let's take a look at that Lambda. And I have like a little sample payload here. It's just gonna write a test object. So I'll just drop that in the test and run it. Okay, so we're getting something that said that it should have worked. So let's head over to S3. And there's our file, so, um, so that's it. So that's like all it, you can literally, in a live demo, uh, deploy like an entire application with the CDK. So uh, yeah, so all right, that's, that's what I got. So thanks. That was an awesome demo. So this is where you know, some of the power of uh, CDK is where um, somebody who understands the infrastructure really well can uh, build a uh, reference architecture and make it available to hundreds or thousands of engineers and um, everybody can then reuse the best practices. Um, so here's a saying from um, Eric Raymond, right? A good programmer knows what to write, great ones know what to rewrite. Um, and we see this from time to time, right? Large enterprises, um, mid-sized organizations. Um, you all, you, a lot of times find better ways to do things. So you wanna build a mechanism where you can start with something which is good enough and iterate over it. Um, all along have the guardrails around security, around best practices, around compliance. And a mechanism like this with a construct is able to give you that uh, because your specialist can now build that construct, make the version one available, and then iterate over it and know that you know, all the best practices are still met. Um, here at AWS, we actually do believe in uh, reuse and uh, building to best practices quite heavily. Um, and uh, to help out with that, we are also investing in um, um, in mechanisms that are able to build this for the entire community, right? So historically, CloudFormation, um, CDK, we've built AWS resources, um, so you could build resources like queues, um, right, DynamoDB tables, Lambda functions, ECS, Fargate, what have you. Uh, but the initiative here um, is to be able to extend that to services and capabilities outside of native AWS resources. So if you um, you know, have a service that you want to pull into AWS, um, you could 
could, you know, in this case, in this example, write a, a cloud formation template for it, uh, and that would be that service would then be available to you in the cloud formation registry, just like any other AWS native services. Um, the idea here is that then we can bring the community, right, make the tent much bigger, uh, and use the same mechanisms of reuse, uh, use the same mechanisms of best practices. Um, so, you know, Ravi, as a, as a developer, can now, um, you know, look at my Ravi LLC program, uh, build a template out of it or build a CDK construct out of it and make it available to the, um, to the larger um, you know, community. Uh, this is going to be one of the mechanisms where um, you know, ISVs, um, SaaS providers are also going to be able to um, you know, integrate into AWS a lot more natively. Um, so the idea here is you know, we'll, we're investing in the, uh, in the infrastructure and we're investing in the mechanisms uh, to bring the community to infrastructure as code while we maintain all the, all the best practices that we talked about. Um, another plug for you know, AWS Skill Builder and AWS certifications. Uh, if you have not already seen it, Skill Builder is a free resource that is available to everybody. So you can log in um, and you know, learn about AWS services, learn about reference architectures, learn about best practices, um, so that you can you know, upskill yourself, upskill your organization, or upskill your teams. Um, a plug for AWS certification as well. Uh, you know, if you have the time, if you have the bandwidth, please um, take the time to do it. There is a certification both here at reInvent as well, um, and that'll help you understand the services a lot more deeply um, than just you know, looking at some, some, some documentation. Um, so that's all we had for today. Um, thank you for coming in again. I know we're maybe between you and lunch, so uh, appreciate the time, appreciate the attention, and thank you.